welcome to this episode of Tales from the Bargain Bin, episode 12. I'm Bill Tucker, and with me is for his second appearance on the show, second in a row, because these will be released sequentially. Um, he is the owner of comicbookvideogames.com and the author of The Avengers in Video Games, available wherever you listen, read, or download your favorite book-style media, Mr. Blair Farrell. What's going on, man? Uh, not much. It's great to be back to back. <laughs> back to back. Pretend like we didn't record these back to back. Just <laughs> the theater of the mind, as they say, um, with this sort of thing. Um, uh, we are now talking about a game I know quite a bit about and, and absolutely love, Maniac Mansion. Uh, Blair, did you, you know, we kind of talked about it a little bit seconds before we started talking about it um, properly for this show. Um What's your history with Maniac Mansion? How'd you acquire it? Um, kind of what were your thoughts of it when you first played it? Yeah, um, we got it for, I think it was Christmas, my brother and I, and I don't know where my parents even got it to because where I grew up, we, like, I'm from a very, very small town. I'm talking like 2,000 people. Oh. And we don't, we didn't have like a Funko Land or any video game stores. We just had. Uh, what was called Wolco, which is the equivalent of the Walmart. And I remember we got this. It didn't even have a box. It just came in a rental case with the manual. So it was just the game we got. And because it was the game we got, we just dove headfirst into it. And this is probably like one of my earliest instances of horror. Because this game, like I played this when I was like five, six, seven. It got pretty scary at points when you're kind of just like stumble into like one of the like weird ed and edna and the whole family oh yeah totally yeah it's creepy and there's it's got some fright to it did you play the was it the nes version yes it was the nes version and we have the nes version uh where they didn't edit out the ability to put the hamster in the microwave i was gonna ask you gotta ask did you put the hamster in the microwave oh of course i did I never knew you could do it. I, I did a full two-hour episode on Maniac Mansion with uh, Magecast gosh, earlier this year because uh, I love this game. I literally, we literally talked about it for two hours. And I never knew you could do that because I always played – and actually, I'll start with you. I'll, but my main three were always you know, Dave, of course, Bernard, and Michael. Um, and I, none of those can put the hamster – in the microwave you have to be one of the rockers either sid or razor and that that's the only way you can do it at least in the nes version um so i didn't even know you could do that until i posted it online everyone's like you you have to you have to nuke the hamster nuke the hamster that was that's kind of what i did um too much of my shock and surprise it actually does work um yeah what was your what were your main characters that you played as when you played it so I think we tried a little bit of everyone because I know this was like the ultimate playground game because there's multiple endings, but getting them is really challenging. So we would always get so far um, and then not be able to make it to the end. So I think the only way I can make it to the end was uh, to use Michael to develop the film to right. give to Ed to um, become your friend. Right. And I think Bernard, we would just use to like pull the brick in the jail. <laughs> like I don't even oh. think we used him. Well, I we never used. I never used Dave. Dave was literally in jail the whole time. It was Bernard and Michael for me. So that was kind of my my main three. But I never really played with Sid and Razor a lot until I replayed it for that show. Um, I I, I love my brother is a huge fan of point and click adventures he loves them he he was really into the king's quest series why i don't know um actually we there's a whole episode um of this very show about point and click adventures where people share their stories of games like maniac mansion like day of the tentacle and even the early sierra stuff um so he talks a lot about it there but um he loves those games so he i think probably saw this in nintendo power and said oh i want this on the old christmas list not realizing, nor are parents realizing that it's, you know, it's pretty, there's some horror elements to this game. Um, but we just fell in love with the humor and 
the puzzles were, I think, just hard enough to where you felt like a genius when you figured it out. Um, there are some weird ones in there. Um, but yeah, that was our experience with it. We 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 loved it. Um, Blair, you said earlier you're not the biggest fan of point and clicks in general, though. Um, yeah, it was just something that we didn't really interact with because we never got a computer in our house until 1996. So um, there weren't really that many on Nintendo. I think like things like Shadowgate and Deja Vu, which you know I would go to the rental store and see on the shelves, and I would kind of look at the box and. They didn't appeal to me at all. Um, so by the time we got a PC, and, and they, they couldn't run games very well, um, or the one we had anyway, and the new hotness was kind of like Doom and Duke Nukem and things like that. So I think the most other than this we played was like Hugo's House of Horrors, which I think is more of like a text adventure with some graphics. Well, well, because computers back in those days, they were not designed for games or your parents didn't buy them for you to play games. They bought them for homework and for, you know, book reports and Grolier's encyclopedia on CD. Like they didn't buy it for the reason of to play games. That's what you had consoles for. They were for homework. Yeah. So it's not surprising. I was the same way. Our My computer couldn't run anything, you know. So they're all my gaming was done on the NES or the Super NES. One thing I always like to bring up when we talk about Maniac Mansion is it's phenomenal. And I want to underline phenomenal soundtrack. The music in NES Maniac Mansion is among my favorite. Um, definitely of the NES era for sure. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. And I, I just even just thinking about the different characters and each one of them has their own theme. And that was like half the fun was like getting a new teen and then just immediately getting their cd player to see what their song sounded like yes and how they kind of like linked up with their personality like somehow like bernard's music is like oh this is like nerdy music but then razor is like this hard rocking like yes music that's like i just i'm hearing it in my head right now (laughs) oh absolutely and and if if i'm if i have the time i will be layering it into this very episode as we discuss this Um, cause it's across the board good. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's an incredible, incredible soundtrack really makes good advantage of everything the NES can do sound wise. Cause there's not really much else sound wise in the game. You have a ticking clock occasionally, and you'll have like the opening of a door, the opening of a, but really there's no, no other real sound effect in the game other than special ones like the, uh, you know, the, like the Cadillac or the Edsel shooting into the sky etc um the villains have their theme as i know like when you hear that music like you're just like your stomach is in your it's like churning you're like oh man i was actually thinking prior recording this like because one of the puzzles is getting ed out of his room and like you get someone to ring the doorbell so he can leave so you can go get the hamster and a card i think yep and And stamps too right yeah, and it seems like, and I always thought uh, when I played that, because your character moves pretty fast, but at that point, you're slowed down. And I wonder if it was intentionally done that way as a way to convey, like, kind of the jelly that one of their characters would have in their legs, like, running into that room and, like, for That's... fear of getting caught. Sure. I never thought of that. Right, because there's no real reason why like slowdown would occur. It's not a, you know, a resource intensive moment. Maybe because you know, obviously, off off screen that character, you know, Ed is going down, um, uh, going down the the stairs and such. But man, I don't know. That's a very good point. Because you're right, there is like a slowness that happens. Man, it's tense. And the first time um, Edna uh, happens upon you and at the refrigerator. It's a beautiful bit of jump scare. And again, I'm not the biggest fan of jump scares, but when it's well done and well crafted, I kind of nod and go, all right, that was, that was pretty good. Um, the fact that you are kind of scooting along, you're running along, you're in the forward third of the frame, you come across the, the refrigerator, and boom, you are face-to-face with Edna. That music starts... <laughs> You 
try to run. You can't. There's no chance. And uh, you get captured. It's such a good piece of uh, design there. For sure. And it's so unlike, like, I think that point, Nintendo games to me were mostly, like, side-scrolling action games. So this was so different from anything I had played. Because I was used like, Mega Man, Castlevania, Mario, etc., or anything with, like, a license. And now suddenly it's like you have this screen with, like, all these commands and you're essentially just like clicking along and it works really well in the Nintendo controller too. Like that can also go understated. Yeah. And that's, it's surprisingly good. I've tried to play actually relatively recently when I was streaming a lot, I was, I streamed a playthrough of deja vu and cause I have a lot of fondness for that game. It is annoying to pilot a mouse with a cursor with an NES controller. It is it is baffling. It's like, how did we do this? It is just laborious. But for some reason, Maniac Mansion, I think, just works better. I don't, I don't know why, but it, it certainly does. And they also have those quick commands, too. Like, if you hit select, I think, it cycles through get, use, open, which I think are your most three com- uh, use commands. So you can just kind of get to those pretty fast without having to, like, go, like, in the bottom and finding the word. Okay. Yep. Yeah, right. Finding the actual verb that that describes what you want to do for sure. I was kind of trolling through the manual as we were discussing this here, and it's interesting how it the game or the developers of the game have to kind of describe what this is. And I think that speaks to what you were saying: is a lot of the games of the era were side side scrolling um, action games or shooter games or shmups or. You know, sports games. We all know what baseball is, right? We can all figure that out. But I can imagine putting this in the hands of a kid who just has no clue, like, what this is. Like, I got to move this little pointer around and where I point, the person goes. Um, It actually lists out exactly what this gaming, gaming, what this uh, game is. It's very long, but I'll read it real quick. You'll find that each of the seven teenagers you can choose from has special skills, talents, and weaknesses. And each of the crazy occupants of the mansion has goals and desires that can help or hinder your team, depending on how you handle them. The story and your approach to rescuing Sandy will be different depending on which kids you choose and how you interact with the people and things inside the mansion itself. Yeah, that's all like really load-bearing information, right? (laughs) Like, you wouldn't know that. Um, Next paragraph I think is interesting. Each of the possible stories in Maniac Mansion is really a large, complex puzzle made up of scores of smaller puzzles. From time to time, movie-like cutscenes reveal clues about the story and what's going on elsewhere. As you discover the smaller puzzles that make up each storyline, you'll find that most will have to be solved in a certain order. There can be several ways to get something done, but of course, there is always a best way. Good luck. Have fun, kid! Here's the rest of this year, because you got this for Christmas. <laughs> I, th- I think that's really interesting they put that in there because that very well encapsulates kind of what this game's about. And I'm kind of lucky that we did have the manual as I know we didn't have the box. It just, however my parents got it, as we didn't have a lot of, we didn't have any secondhand game stores. But I guess like around that era, like everywhere was just sen- selling Nintendo things. So they might have just been like at the front register of a grocery store for all I know. <laughs> um, right? Could have been at a convenience store or something just sitting there. Yeah, unboxed. That's interesting, huh? Uh, they actually have a little mention of what a cutscene actually is. They tell you what it is because not many kids had seen cutscenes up to that point. Yeah, it was like this and Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> right, you know, and, and the Ninja Gaiden cutscenes are really just flavor. They're not vital. Like in maniac mansion the cutscenes are super important like you have to pay attention oh yeah um, to what's going on with it and if you had a hard time with maniac mansion you could have purchased a hint book just 795 include shipping and handling order a maniac mansion hint book nice excellent i didn't know that existed oh i'm sure they did there's probably like I think we had an issue of possibly Game Players magazine with this on the front that might have had some hints. And then the rest of it was just like my brother and I talking to other people who had it. Yeah. And then tribal knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Giving like, oh, man, if you play this sound and then put it on a tape, 
and then put it in this room, then it breaks the glass on the chandelier to get the key to open this door, <laughs> like stuff like that. And then you'd be like, okay, I got to go home and try that right away. Yeah, totally. You know, it was, it was a great way of, of kind of shit. Again, it was that kind of communal knowledge that kids would share back in those days that we just don't have anymore. Like that doesn't exist. If, if, if a kid needs or a, person needs a help on a game they go online they look it up and the answer is there and they move on with their lives the self the the discovery of all these weird little things that honestly most people wouldn't be able to figure out just on their own like you needed that assistance or really pushing at the edges um really it led to like a community and i think that's why people like myself and you and others really love this game not just because of the game because of some of the connections we may have made along the way while trying to figure the damn thing out. Have you ever gotten stuck in Manic Mansion where, because there are ways you can get stuck, um, Day of the Tentacle, which is a game you haven't played, which I am baffled that you haven't played. The remasters are out there. They're really good. Just, I don't know, take take a few hours and play Day of the Tentacle. It's wonderful. Well, I think it's uh, kind of, I think we were trying to, the point is that, you can get so far and then yes because i knew how to like for example um because there's a green tentacle and he's sad that he can't uh, get his demo tape out um so you have razor who can kind of record something and then they are like okay let's do something but then you don't know what to do with that information afterwards because, like, Wendy is an yeah. author, and you can, like, write a manuscript, but then you send the manuscripts, but you're like, okay, what do I do now? And I had a lot of instances like that, where I would yeah. find something out, like, using the um, developer to grow the plant to climb to the observatory, right, and then right. not knowing what to do with that information. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of weird stuff. Like, I thought one of the weirder ones was... You had to, one of the ones was you, were, you had to restore the power. And this is actually where I got stuck, not because I didn't know what to do, stuck because I made the wrong choice and I could no longer progress in the game. It was impossible for me at that point, given my character combination and the weapon, the items I had, I was not able to complete it. There are moments where you can do that. I did that when I played it a few months ago for Magecast. There is a series when you're using Bernard and, and Michael and, and Dave. So you have to restore power to the arcade to have Fred uh, or yeah, the, the, the scientist, I might get my names messed up, but to get the scientist to come up and play an arcade game. And then you have to put another quarter in and see what his high score was. That's the code to the giant door. After you've removed the locks, oh, you I've move never... two locks and a giant. Yeah. You remove two. And the, it's really esoteric and weird, but you get a cutscene where, the scientist goes up, plays a game, and it's just one particular game, and then goes back down and, and does it. And you have to have coins on you to make the thing happen. Fine. So you go back up to this area that's now illuminated where you can, tur- you can turn the light on, obviously, and progress. And if there is a – I don't think it's exposed wires because the exposed wires um, Bernard can fix if you turn off the power to the house. Remember, the house is powered by a nuclear reactor, as homes are, I guess, in that (laughs) world of Maniac Mansion. But there's a point where if you use the paint remover in the wrong place, it disappears. It's gone. And I used a paint remover at some point during that sequence because I was trying to figure it out logically. Like, well, it was, oh, that's right. It was something was written very small on the wall. So I'm trying. I don't have a magnifying glass. I don't have anything. And then all of a sudden, I, I'm like, well, let me let me use the paint remover. That's the only thing writing wall thing I have. I use it. Bernard goes, well, that was a waste. And that's it. At that point, I can't progress because I can't expose the door that's actually behind the giant paint splash towards the end of the hallway. So restart. That literally you cannot do anything. And I looked it up and I they're like it's like, yeah, if you do that, you're doomed. I don't There's think I've you can do. ever found the code in the arcade machine. I'm pretty sure I always found it. it can you find it on the wall in the dungeon with the paint? I want it. I, I think you can't. You, yeah, go ahead. I think that's how we always done it because I, I never knew. I knew we could fix the arcade machine and put a quarter in. 
but I never knew what to do with it. Oh, I have to try that maybe later on. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. That's and that's the code for the, the that's the code for the padlock or the the number pad that's on the actual door because you need a key to open up the two locks and then that's the the third way to get in. Um, my favorite. What would you say your of all the ones you've done? Your favorite ending is. I think I've only ever gotten one, and that's um, using the uh, developing the plans for the commando kit, and then uh, giving them to Ed, who helps you storm the yes um, uh, the basement, and then you put the uh, meteor into the trunk of the car and launch it in the space. Yep, that's like yep. the I'll- only ending I've ever been able to achieve. That's the, that's like the standard and they don't say standard, but that's that's the one I always was able to do without much assistance. There is a when the manuscript, I believe and I got to remember, I'm getting confused because there is an ending and it might be the manuscript. I should look this up first. but I'm just going to go off of memory. If you actually successfully submit the manuscript, I believe it's the um, the meteors story. And then the media, the meteor ends up on like late night TV, sitting in a chair being interviewed because he becomes famous for this amazing book he's written. <laughs> and I, 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 maybe this was a fever dream. Maybe I hit my head. I don't know, but that I, I have very strong memories of of that ending with the manuscript with Wendy, which is one of the ones. And I, I forget who's the surfer dude. There's a uh, surfer dude. Jeff, I think he can Jeff. fix the phone. Yeah, he does very little <laughs> in this game. He is relatively useless, unfortunately, Jeff. Um, but the record label one is fun too, where you can submit uh, and get get the Green Tentacle his uh, his record contract and all that. Now, did you know there was a show? Yes. I, okay, I think this might have come up in one of our conversations. I couldn't remember if it was you or somebody else. Did you watch this show? I did, and it was very strange because I think it it aired in Canada on a channel called the Family Channel, and it's something we would only get periodically in free previews because we had played the game, and then we saw the show, and we're like, oh, man, it's Maniac Mansion. We love that. But then the show is, um, there's like a, child in the man of a body or a child in the body of a man and then there's like an uncle who's a fly and they have the names of the characters but it has like nothing to do with the game whatsoever <laughs> it is it is literally the it's literally a story a show written by somebody who's never played the games it has to be there's no way that somebody played the games and then put that together I, I like to think I'm willing to suffer for this show and for my craft. I like to think that. I've watched some really bad movies for games my mom found. <laughs> I, I've, you know, I've gone through some rough games. I played a little bit, a good amount of James Bond Jr. for that episode. I tried to watch um, the Maniac Mansion pilot, and I got through exactly five minutes. And I said, I can't. I can't. Punching out Maverick. I just can't do it. <laughs> just can't do it. It's it's baffling. So if you're out there, listeners, and you have experience with um <laughs> with this uh with this show and actually have fond memories, I'd love to just pick your brain about it. Everyone's a fan of something. Everyone's a fan of something. I right now, a little spoiler, I guess. I for for my Zelda series, which is starting in um my Zelda series, which is starting October third. There's an actual date. The first two episodes are done. So it's now officially a thing. Um, I am going through every single uh, game or yeah, every single game or era of Legend of Zelda. So I'm doing 8-bit, 16-bit, and you know, up all the way through. And I'm trying to go all the way through to the very end. We're going to cover all of it. And throughout this, I am going to focus on a little bit of the CDI. I am going to do an episode on the CDI games. I am hell-bent I'm finding somebody who will talk to me about the CDI games. And I'm trying to find fans. I'm trying to find like, hey, are there, is, there like a, is there like a secret fan group out there? So of- I don't know how to reach him. Uh, there is a, okay. a YouTube. Um, I think his name is Yawel. Uh, he, the YouTube channel is Wrestling with Gaming. And it's really great uh, documentaries. They actually have one about the creation of Perfect Dark that's really oh, cool. well-researched. 
but he loves the CDI. Like people get him to autograph CDIs at conventions. You can get him. I I have ways. I am persistent when it comes to getting people on the show. <laughs> Send me that information. Ah, see? And now everyone listening to this can like just realize this is how the process works. It's called networking. Figure it out. Um, yeah, interesting. I'll, I'll have to check that out for sure. And that just about does it for this episode of Tales from the Bargain Bin. If you enjoyed this podcast and conversation about Maniac Mansion, you can check out my other conversation on MageCast, which was episode 59 released a year ago almost exactly a year ago september 13th 2021 i uh, checked that out um the well-read mage and i talk about maniac mansion for a good two hours the conversation just goes places we we get all we just we just it goes places um we do what we do when we talk about games um if you are not familiar with the a gamer looks at 40 podcast the main show we are currently in our back to school uh bonus season uh, Legend of Zelda series starts on October 3rd. Extremely excited. Cannot wait for that to be released and to go on that journey with y'all. Um, it's going to be a really good series. I got some really cool stories. Um, the episodes are shaping up to be pretty good. And um, yeah, I think y'all will be fans of it if you're fans of the series. If you don't like Zelda, well, they have, there's like 50 other episodes. Check those out. There's a lot of stuff, lot of stuff there. Uh, Thank you again, Blair, for joining me on the show here. And until next time, just continue being awesome.